Motivational Summaries presents to you the book Think Again, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know, written by Adam Grant. Humans have a tendency to suffer from tunnel vision. We assume the first idea that comes to mind will be correct, thanks to our natural intelligence. However, in a turbulent world, having the ability to unlearn and rethink is in fact far more powerful. Rethinking is the business superpower of the 21st century. Section 1 of 9 Rethinking Personal To be able to rethink effectively, you first have to open your mind to other possibilities. This is harder than you might assume. Three suggestions are 1. Develop the habit of rethinking. 2. Always collaborate your confidence levels. 3. Actively invite others to question your ideas. 1. Develop the habit of rethinking. Mike Lazaridis came up with the idea of the BlackBerry as a wireless communication device for sending and receiving emails. In 2009, BlackBerry accounted for almost half of the U.S. smartphone market. By 2014, BlackBerry's market share had fallen to less than 1%. Most commentators suggested BlackBerry failed to adapt. But companies cannot adapt. People have to do that by making different decisions every day. Adam Grant said, quote, Most of us take pride in our knowledge and expertise, and in staying true to our beliefs and opinions. That makes sense in a stable world, where we get rewarded for having conviction in our ideas. The problem is that we live in a rapidly changing world, where we need to spend as much time rethinking as we do thinking. Rethinking is a skill set, but it's also a mindset. We already have many of the mental tools we need. We just have to remember to get them out of the shed and remove the rust. End quote. When someone comes along and challenges what you believe in, chances are you will probably slip into one of three different modes. One, preacher mode, where if someone doubts your beliefs, you marshal arguments and deliver sermons to prove the other party is wrong. Two, prosecutor mode, where you try and highlight the flaws in the other person's reasoning. Three, Politician mode, where you attempt to win people over to your way of thinking. A fourth and more productive mode is to go into rethink mode and see whether the facts don't in fact lead to another conclusion. This is also the scientist mode, where you allow the facts to drive the conclusion, not your personal preferences. The scientific method is to state a hypothesis and then run experiments to see whether it's right or wrong. This approach also works well in business. For example, it's not unusual for startups to run pilot programs and then pivot based on the results of those early experiments. If results are not what you expect, you study the underlying data to see if a viable commercial opportunity lies in doing something different. Mike Lazaridis thought like a scientist when he created the BlackBerry, but then moved into preacher, prosecutor, and politician modes as BlackBerry grew. When the iPhone and instant messaging apps like WhatsApp came along, he failed to respond. His unwillingness to be flexible would ultimately consign BlackBerry to the annals of history. George Bernard Shaw said, quote, Progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. End quote. Adam Grant said, quote, Research shows that when people are resistant to change, it helps to reinforce what will stay the same. Visions for change are more compelling when they include visions of continuity. Although our strategy might evolve, our identity will endure. The curse of knowledge is that it closes our minds to what we don't know. Good judgment depends on having the skill and the will to open our minds. I'm pretty confident that in life, rethinking is an incredibly important habit. End quote. Always try and think like a scientist. Base identity on values, not opinions. In every situation, seek contrary information. 2. Always collaborate your confidence levels. Adam Grant said, quote, We all have blind spots in our knowledge and opinions. The bad news is, is that they can leave us blind to our blindness, which gives us false confidence in our judgment and prevents us from rethinking. 
The good news is that with the right kind of confidence, we can learn to see ourselves more clearly and update our views. To see ourselves more clearly and update our views. In driver's training, we were taught to identify our visual blind spots and eliminate them with the help of mirrors and sensors. In life, since our minds don't come equipped with those tools, we need to learn to recognize our cognitive blind spots and revise our thinking accordingly. End quote. The key to being able to rethink effectively is you have to find the sweet spot combination of both confidence and competence. You also need to avoid two syndromes. Being an armchair quarterback, where your confidence far outweighs your actual competence. This is described as being a situation where those who can't don't know they can't. If you're certain about something, you won't engage in rethinking. Suffering from imposter syndrome, where competence far exceeds confidence. If you're blind to your strengths and feel unqualified, it will be very hard for you to rethink anything. The ideal is you want to have confident humility, and fortunately, that can be taught. When you doubt that you're as good as others, that will force you to work harder. Embrace your fears and use them as fuel. Doubts will motivate you to work smarter. Fears can also make you become a better learner as you'll be more willing to learn from others. Harness and take all the positives you can from your fears. The perfect example of confident humility is Spanx founder Sarah Blakely. When she came up with the concept of footless pantyhose, Sarah doubted that her current skill set as a door-to-door fax salesperson would be much help. Furthermore, she didn't know anything about fashion, retail, or even manufacturing for that matter. What Sarah Blakely did have going for her was self-belief she could learn what was needed to make her idea a reality. Sarah spent a week driving around hosiery mills to ask for help and was a quick learner. Sarah Blakely couldn't afford to hire a law firm to apply for a patent, so she read a book on the topic and filled in the patent application herself. Sarah certainly had her doubts, but she was also confident she could learn what needed to be done. That's confident humility in action. Adam Grant said, quote, In rigorous studies of leadership, effectiveness across the United States and China, the most productive and innovative teams aren't run by leaders who are confident or humble. The most effective leaders score high in both confidence and humility. Although they have faith in their strengths, they're also keenly aware of their weaknesses. They know they need to recognize and transcend their limits if they want to push the limits of greatness. End quote. Adam Grant then said, quote, Arrogance leaves us blind to our weaknesses. Humility is a reflective lens. It helps us see them clearly. Confident humility is a corrective lens. It enables us to overcome those weaknesses. End quote. Don't confuse confidence with competence. Always harness the benefits of doubt. Embrace the joy of being wrong. 3. Actively invite others to question your ideas. Ray Dalio founder of Bridgewater, said, quote, If you don't look back at yourself and think, wow, how stupid I was a year ago, then you must not have learned much in the last year. End quote. One exceptionally good technique for enhancing your willingness to rethink is to actively invite others to question your ideas and then be happy when they prove you wrong. If you can pull that off, your abilities to become a good rethinker will soar. A great example of this were Wilbur and Orville Wright of Kitty Hawk fame. Bicycle makers by trade, their robust arguments with each other during the construction of Kitty Hawk were legendary and loud. They were also very public. Their last great challenge was to design a propeller and, as the brothers struggled with this, they argued back and forth for months. It got so bad their younger sister, Catherine, threatened to leave the house if they didn't stop fighting. Adam Grant said, quote, They kept at it anyway until one night it culminated in what might have been the loudest shouting match of their lives. Strangely, the next morning, they came into the shop and acted as if nothing had happened. They picked up the argument about the propeller right where they had left off, only now without the yelling. 
Soon, they were both rethinking their assumptions and stumbling onto what would become one of their biggest breakthroughs. Orville showed up at the shop first and told their mechanic that he had been wrong. They should design the propeller Wilbur's way. Then Wilbur arrived and started arguing against his own idea, suggesting that Orville might be right. As they shifted into scientist mode, they focused less on why different solutions would succeed or fail, and more on how those solutions might work. Finally, they identified problems with both of their approaches and realized they were both wrong. End quote. The solution the Wrights came up with, of course, was that their plane didn't need a propeller. It needed two propellers, spinning in opposite directions, to balance each other out and to function something like a rotating wing. This was the breakthrough they needed. Adam Grant said, quote, In Wilbur, Orville had a built-in challenge network. Wilbur was known to be highly disagreeable. He was unfazed by other people's opinions and had a habit of pouncing on anyone else's idea the moment it was raised. Orville was known as gentle, cheerful, and sensitive to criticism. Yet, those qualities seemed to vanish in his partnership with his brother. He's such a good scrapper, Wilbur said. One sleepless night, Orville came up with an idea to build a rudder that was movable rather than fixed. The next morning at breakfast, as he got ready to pitch the idea to Wilbur, Orville winked at a colleague of theirs, expecting Wilbur to go into challenge mode and demolish it. Much to his surprise, Wilbur saw the potential in the idea immediately, and it became one of their major discoveries. End quote. You're probably not designing an airplane, but if you want to do more rethinking, surround yourself with people who will argue with you. Build your own challenge network and give people the green light to tell you when your ideas stink. That doesn't have to involve a shouting match like the rights, but make it clear you welcome challenges to your ideas. Note, this is about task conflict rather than relationship conflict. Don't take challenges personally. Keep reminding yourself the adversary is not the person who challenges your ideas, but bad ideas themselves. Have the mindset that healthy, robust, direct debate is an incredible disinfectant. It can rid your mind of stinking ideas and create space for much better ideas to come to the surface. Charles Darwin said, quote, Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. End quote. Adam Grant said, quote, The absence of conflict is not harmony, it's apathy. End quote. Try and learn from everyone you meet. Build your own robust challenge network. Welcome and foster constructive conflict. Adam Grant said, quote, The absence of conflict is not harmony, it's apathy. End quote. Try and learn from everyone you meet. Build your own robust challenge network. Welcome and foster constructive conflict. Section 4 of 9 Encouraging the people close to you to rethink their assumption is... <coughs> Encouraging the people close to you to rethink their assumptions is tricky, but necessary. To achieve that, two good ideas are teach everyone how to ask better questions and view disagreements as dances, not duels. Teach everyone how to ask better questions. Adam Grant said, quote, When we're trying to persuade people, we frequently take an adversarial approach. Instead of opening their minds, we effectively shut them down or rile them up. They play defense by putting up a shield, play offense by preaching their perspectives and prosecuting ours, or play politics by telling us what we want to hear without changing what they actually think. I want to explore a more collaborative approach, one in which we show more humility and curiosity and invite others to think more like scientists. End quote. Some people love being direct and forceful. You overwhelm the other party with the best data and leave them no logical alternative but to come around to your way of thinking. Simple, but wrong. Trying to strong-arm someone into thinking a different way rarely works. A much more effective way to get others to rethink their positions is to start by asking them some good questions that make them think. This technique has now come to be called motivational interviewing. 
For example, an epidemiologist meets with parents who are concerned that measles vaccines may give their children autism. Rather than adopting the more confrontational approach of going through mountains of data about vaccine safety and efficacy, the epidemiologist started by saying he wasn't judging the parents, but just wanted to understand how they had reached their conclusion to not vaccinate. For about an hour, a number of open-ended questions were asked to try to understand the parents' decisions. At the end of the discussion, the epidemiologist acknowledged the world is full of confusing data. He also acknowledged that the parents were free to choose what was best for their own kids, and that he trusted their ability and intentions. A few days later, the parents agreed to let their children be vaccinated. Adam Grant said, quote, Today, motivational interviewing is used around the world by tens of thousands of practitioners. Motivational interviewing has been the subject of more than a thousand controlled trials. It's been used effectively by health professionals to help people stop smoking, abusing drugs and alcohol, gambling and having unsafe sex, as well as to improve their diets and exercise habits, overcome eating disorders, and lose weight. It's also been applied successfully by coaches to build grit in professional soccer players, teachers to nudge students to get a full night's sleep, consultants to prepare teams for organizational change, public health workers to encourage people to disinfect water in Zambia, and environmental activists to help people do something about climate change. End quote. Motivational interviewing involves asking open-ended questions that ultimately lead to self-discovery and self-persuasion. You ask sustained questions to get background information about how they formed their current opinions. You then ask change questions to get them thinking about their desire, ability, and need to make adjustments. By asking why and how they might change, you seed their desire to follow through and make those changes. In other words, to rethink their position. The suggested way to end a motivational interview and for key transition points is to summarize what the other person is saying. You explain your understanding of what they've said and the conditions under which they might change their views. You then check whether you've missed or represented anything and inquire about their plans moving forward and possible next steps. Adam Grant said, quote, Part of the beauty of motivational interviewing is that it generates more openness in both directions. Listening can encourage others to reconsider their stance towards us, but it also gives us information that can lead us to question our own views about them. If we take the practices of motivational interviewing seriously, we might become the ones who think again. It's not hard to grasp how motivational interviewing can be effective for consultants, doctors, therapists, teachers, and coaches. When people have sought out our assistance or accepted that it's our job to help, we're in a position to earn their trust. Yet we all face situations in which we're tempted to steer people in the direction we prefer. Parents and members often believe they know what's best for their children and protégés. Salespeople, fundraisers, and entrepreneurs have a vested interest in getting to yes. End quote. The great thing about asking questions in general and motivational interviewing specifically is you're not trying to browbeat the other party into submission. Instead, you're trying to create the conditions and triggers for rethinking. That means when someone does change their mind, they haven't been manipulated. You can be proud of how you've gone about trying to encourage the change. Adam Grant said, quote, When people ignore advice, it isn't always because they disagree with it. Sometimes, they're resisting the sense of pressure and the feeling that someone else is controlling their decision. To protect their freedom, instead of giving commands or offering recommendations, a motivational interviewer might say something along the lines of, Here are a few things that have helped me. Do you think any of them might work for you? End quote. Use good persuasive questions. Ask how, not why. Ask what would change your mind. Ask how did you form your opinion on this? This is a summary of Think Again, Section 5 of 9. View disagreements as dances, not duels. Adam Grant said, quote, A good debate is not a war. It's not even a tug-of-war. 
where you can drag your opponent to your side if you pull hard enough on the rope. It's more like a dance that hasn't been choreographed, negotiated with a partner who has a different set of steps in mind. If you try too hard to lead, your partner will resist. If you can adapt your moves to hers and get her to do the same, you're more likely to end up in rhythm. End quote. In war, the objective is always to gain ground rather than lose it. Therefore, leaders are prepared to lose a few battles along the way to winning the overall conflict. That's a really poor analogy for negotiations. A good negotiation is like a dance. You can't stand back and let the other party make all the moves. You've got to actively participate. It also helps if you pause and consider big-picture issues from time to time as well. One of the best ways to negotiate is to start by identifying something you both agree on. Find common ground, and you start building momentum to work towards a solution that works for both of you, if it exists. Adam Grant said, quote, When I asked international debate star Harish Nadarajan how to improve at finding common ground, he offered a surprisingly practical tip. Most people immediately start with a straw man poking holes in the weakest version of the other side's case. He does the reverse. He considers the strongest version of their case, which is known as the steel man. A politician might occasionally adopt that tactic to pander or persuade, but like a good scientist, Harish does it to learn, instead of trying to dismantle the argument that preschool is good for kids, for example. Harish accepted that the point was valid, which allowed him to relate to his opponent's perspective and to the audience's. Then, it was perfectly fair and balanced for him to express his concerns about whether a subsidy would give the most underprivileged kids access to preschool. End quote. A second way to better handle disagreements and negotiations is to have a less-is-more mindset. Don't try and introduce 50 reasons why you're right and they're wrong. All that does is make the other party dig in and hang on. They will also zero in on your weakest reason and start dismantling that. Indeed, come up with just two or three for your very best and strongest points and present those. Focus on your key arguments rather than clouding the discussion or negotiation with point after point. Then, encourage curiosity by asking the other person, Do you see any merit in this proposal at all? The more questions you ask, the more they can express their opinions, the less assertive you will come across, and the smoother the negotiation will go. Adam Grant said, quote, The more reasons we put on the table, the easier it is for people to discard the shakiest one. Once they reject one of our justifications, they can easily dismiss our entire case. That happened regularly to the average negotiators. They brought too many weapons to the battle. They lost ground not because of the strength of their most compelling point, but because of the weakness of their least compelling one. Yet the experts did the exact opposite. They actually presented fewer reasons to support their case. They didn't want to water down their best points. As researcher Neil Rackham put it, a weak argument generally dilutes a strong one. End quote. To improve the outcomes of your debates or disagreements, bring a scientist's level of humility and curiosity to the debate. Search for more information and options to make both sides better off. Remember, you're not trying to force the other person to come around to your way of thinking. You're asking them to dance. Tim Kreider said, quote, Exhausting someone in argument is not the same as convincing him. End quote you won't be able to change the other person's mind or even to get them to rethink things if you're not willing to change your mind and your point of view as well. It's also vital to acknowledge when the other party makes a good point and where you disagree with them. Stating what you've learned from them as a result of the discussion is good. That way, when you ask them to rethink, you're being a scientist, not a hypocrite. Adam Grant said, quote, Convincing other people to think again isn't just about making a good argument. It's about establishing that we have the right motives in doing so. When we concede that someone else has made a good point, we signal that we're not preachers, prosecutors, or politicians trying to advance an agenda. 
where scientists trying to get to the truth. Arguments are often far more combative and adversarial than they need to be. Harish told me, you should be willing to listen to what someone else is saying and give them a lot of credit for it. It makes you sound like a reasonable person who is taking everything into account. In 1983, Daryl Davis arrived at a lounge in Maryland to play the piano at a country music gig. After the show, an older white man in the audience came up to Daryl and told him he was astonished to see a black musician play like Jerry Lee Lewis. Daryl replied he was a personal friend and that Jerry Lee Lewis openly acknowledged his style and that Jerry Lee Lewis openly acknowledged his style was influenced by black musicians. The two sat down for a drink, and the white man eventually admitted he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Daryl could have been intimidated, but instead he burst out laughing and asked, How can you hate me when you don't even know me? Their conversation ended with the Klansman handing Daryl his phone number and asking him to call him when he played locally. Adam Grant said, quote, Over time, a friendship grew, and the man ended up leaving the KKK. That was a turning point in Daryl's life, too. It wasn't long before Daryl was sitting down with Imperial Wizards and Grand Dragons, the clan's highest officers, to ask his question. Since then, Daryl has convinced many white supremacists to leave the KKK and abandon their hatred. After getting to know Daryl, one Imperial Wizard didn't stop at leaving the KKK. He shut down the chapter. Years later, he asked Daryl to be his daughter's godfather. End quote. Always try to find common ground. Remember, in most cases, less is more. Reinforce freedom of choice. Have a conversation about the conversation. This is a summary of Think Again, Section 6 of 9. Try and have more nuanced conversations. One good way to get people to rethink is to complexify contentious topics. Rather than saying this is a clear-cut black-and-white issue, make it clear shades of gray also exist. That gives the other person options to agree on some aspects and disagree on others, which is helpful and positive. It also injects humility into the discussion rather than entrenched dogmas. Adam Grant said, quote, Resisting the impulse to simplify is a step toward becoming more argument literate. Doing so has profound implications for how we communicate about polarizing issues. In the traditional media, it can help journalists open people's minds to uncomfortable facts. On social media, it can help all of us have more productive Twitter tiffs and Facebook fights. At family gatherings, it might not land you on the same page as your least favorite uncle, but it could very well prevent a seemingly innocent conversation from exploding into an emotional inferno. And in discussions of policies that affect all our lives, it might bring us better, more practical solutions sooner. If you look at how scientists communicate, they use lots of caveats and contingencies. They will state the conclusion of a study, for example, and then include multiple paragraphs about the limitations of their studies. Non-scientists tend to gloss over those caveats in the pursuit of simple headlines, but you should not. Highlight those contingencies, talk about the unanswered questions that result, introduce comparable studies that reach the opposite conclusion. That's what the real world is like. Adam Grant said, quote, Appreciating complexity reminds us that no behavior is always effective and that all cures have unintended consequences. End quote. The conventional wisdom for negotiations is to always try and put yourself in the other person's shoes so you can walk in lockstep with them. That's logical advice, but in practice, it's not quite that simple to actually do. It turns out humans are rather poor at guessing what another person is thinking, even with the best of intentions. A better way to encourage more rethinking to happen is to remind yourself emotions are almost always a work in progress. They're not only in flux, but there are never just one or two dominant feelings. You always have to remind yourself nuances exist and will be personalized and unique. Adam Grant said, quote, Charged conversations cry out for nuance. 
when we're preaching, prosecuting, or politicking, the complexity of reality can seem like an inconvenient truth. In scientist mode, it can be an invigorating truth. It means there are new opportunities for understanding and for progress. End quote. Amanda Ripley said, quote, When conflict is cliché, complexity is breaking news. End quote. Emma Goldman said, quote, What I believe is a process rather than a finality. End quote. Complexify complicated stuff. Use caveats and contingencies. Expand your emotional options. This is a summary of Think Again, Section 7 of 9. Encourage your kids to be active rethinkers. When you go to school, it gets drilled into you that textbooks hold the definitive truth. Teachers never mention that knowledge can and does evolve all the time and that yesterday's textbooks are outdated for a reason. To counter that bias, you should teach your kids to start thinking like scientists and always question what they learn. How do you do that? Some ideas. One, encourage your kids to be active learners, where they figure things out for themselves rather than waiting to be spoon-fed by their teachers. Let them experiment for themselves and be exposed to a wide variety of ideas. Diverse thinking is great, and you should encourage them to have their own opinions backed up by data. 2. Instill intellectual humility. By having your kids learn with you about new subjects, model for them the practice of rethinking for themselves rather than blindly following the crowd. Encourage your kids to think like young scientists. Identify problems, develop hypotheses, and design experiments to test them. Let them learn what excellence looks like and feels like and the joy of discovery. 3. Teach your kids that it's perfectly fine to do multiple drafts of any projects, where they keep on rethinking, reworking, and polishing their ideas. Explain it's normal for them to keep going back to the drawing board to incorporate new information into their ideas. That will send the signal it's important to think for themselves, not to merely regurgitate what teachers are saying. Adam Grant said, quote, I believe that good teachers introduce new thoughts, but great teachers introduce new ways of thinking. Collecting a teacher's knowledge may help us solve the challenges of the day, but understanding how a teacher thinks can help us navigate the challenges of a lifetime. Ultimately, education is more than the information we accumulate in our heads. It's the habits we develop as we keep revising our drafts and the skills we build to keep learning. End quote. 4. Encourage your kids to become lifelong fact-checkers, where they interrogate information rather than simply consume it, and reject popularity as a proxy for reliability. Help your kids learn that often the sender of information is not its source and errors may have crept in. 5. Have weekly sessions where you debunk the myths that abound in society and teach your kids to think for themselves and run experiments to learn new things. 6. Don't ask your kids what they want to do when they grow up. That only encourages them to define themselves in terms of a career. Instead of narrowing their options, broaden their possibilities. Let them know they can succeed at lots of different careers over the course of their lifetime as long as they keep learning and growing. Have weekly myth-busting sessions Encourage kids to make multiple drafts. Don't emphasize careers. Broaden options. This is a summary of Think Again, Section 8 of 9, Create Learning Organizations Everywhere. Adam Grant said, quote, Rethinking is more likely to happen in a learning culture, where growth is the core value and rethinking cycles are routine. In learning cultures, the norm is for people to know what they don't know, doubt their existing practices, and stay curious about new routines to try out. Evidence shows that in learning cultures, organizations innovate more and make fewer mistakes. End quote. Building a learning culture at work is tricky because people will be afraid if they speak up or challenge the boss, they might get fired or miss out on promotional opportunities. To offset that and signal rethinking is welcome here, 
you've got to provide a combination of two factors. One, psychological safety, where people can speak up and take risks without the fear of being punished. Learning to do something new always involves a learning curve, often with early failures. To build psychological safety, you need to have leaders who ask for unvarnished feedback or constructive criticism and then act on it. It also helps if leaders candidly talk about their past mistakes as well. 2. Accountability Where you signal organizational learning is welcome as an ongoing business function. Celebrate your successes and reward those who drive them. Teach everyone how to run good experiments. Encourage everyone to challenge the status quo and run experiments as they see fit. In many organizations, people become fond of and then strongly attach to best practices. That's all well and good, but as soon as you designate something as being best in its class, it tends to become frozen in time. People stop questioning it and start adopting it exclusively. They also cease looking for improvements, which is bad. You need to give your people encouragement to keep rethinking all your organization's processes all the time. Build a genuine learning organization. It's the only way to avoid tunnel vision and to get ahead of the curve in a dynamic world where things change all the time. Adam Grant said, quote, When people lack knowledge about a complex topic, like stopping a pandemic or reinvigorating an economy, they might be comfortable with leaders admitting what they don't know today and doubting the statements they made yesterday. When people feel more informed and the problem is simpler, they might dismiss leaders who acknowledge uncertainty and change their minds as flip-floppers. We can all improve at thinking again. I think the world would be a better place if everyone put on scientist goggles a little more often. End quote. Replace best practices with accountability. Provide safety to challenge the status quo. Keep a rethinking scorecard of experiments. This is a summary of Think Again. Section 9 of 9. Always be open to rethinking your beliefs. Adam Grant said, quote, When we dedicate ourselves to a plan and it isn't going as we hoped, our first instinct isn't usually to rethink it. Instead, we tend to double down and sink more resources into the plan. This pattern is called escalation of commitment. Evidence shows that entrepreneurs persist with failing strategies when they should pivot. NBA general managers and coaches keep investing in new contracts and more playing time for draft busts. And politicians continue sending soldiers to wars that didn't need to be fought in the first place. Sunk costs are a factor, but the most important causes appear to be psychological rather than economic. Escalation of commitment happens because we're rationalizing creatures, constantly searching for self-justifications for our private beliefs as a way to soothe our egos, shield our images, and validate our past decisions. End quote. Escalation of commitment is a major factor in many preventable failures, and notably, this can be fueled by grit, one of the business world's most celebrated drivers of success. Researchers have found there's a very fine line between heroic persistence and stubborn foolishness. There are times where the best kind of grit is actually to reverse course rather than press on at all costs. In addition, the world is changing fast. Many people can remember a world where Google, Uber, Facebook, and even the Internet did not exist. Old industries are constantly evolving, and the most successful industries and careers of the future might not even exist yet. To position yourself to excel in the future and to get better at rethinking on a regular basis, a few smart things you can start doing now are 1. Throw away your 10-year plans or lifetime career plans and commit to evolving and growing as you go. New industries are emerging faster than ever thanks to technology. Have the mindset that you're prepared and willing to leave one career path if a new and better one opens up. Be confident in your capacity to learn and adapt and to engage in regular rethinking and changing. 2. Schedule periodic checkups, 
where you go through all your plans and goals and ask, What has changed since I made my plans, and how have I adjusted for those changes? Have I reached a learning plateau in my current job, and is it time to pivot? What due diligence have I done on alternative business plans for my organization or team? What have I learned in the past year? What new possibilities am I curious about? What am I going to do about those new opportunities? 3. Be aware that sometimes chasing happiness ends up scaring it away. So rethink your actions rather than change your surroundings. Don't think about moving to a new country. Build a micro-community of learners and find ways to contribute and connect. 4. Set aside time for rethinking and relearning where you plan what you want to learn and contribute in the next year or two. Get comfortable with the analogy that writing a plan for your entire life and career based on what you know today is like driving at night in the fog. Some things you'll get right, but most you will not. Get comfortable with the fact you can only see as far ahead as your headlights illuminate at the moment, and learn to live with that. Throw away your 10-year plan. Rethink your actions, not just surroundings. Schedule a regular life checkup. Make some time to unlearn and think again. A great example of the need to rethink are smoke jumpers, the elite and celebrated wildland firefighters who parachute into forests to extinguish the fires which get started by lightning. These forest fires can have flames 30 feet in the air and spread fast enough to cover the length of two football fields in less than a minute when driven by wind. In August of 1949, a 15-man smoke jumping team parachuted in to fight a forest fire in Montana. Less than an hour after landing, the wind changed directions, and it came directly at the team. Rather than fight it, they were forced to run for their lives. By 5.53, they were heading up a steep incline, trying to reach the top of a ridge and safety that was only 200 yards away, but the fire was gaining on them. Adam Grant said, quote, With safety in sight, but the fire swiftly advancing, the foreman, Wagner Dodge, did something that baffled his crew. Instead of trying to outrun the fire, he stopped and bent over. He took out a matchbook, started lighting matches, and threw them into the grass. We thought he must have gone nuts, one later recalled. With the fire almost on our back, what the hell is the boss doing lighting another fire in front of us? It's no surprise that the crew didn't follow Dodge when he waved his arms towards his fire and yelled, Up! Up this way! What the smoke jumpers didn't realize was that Dodge had devised a survival strategy. He was building an escape fire. By burning the grass ahead of him, he cleared the area of fuel for the wildfire to feed on. He then poured water from his canteen onto his handkerchief, covered his mouth with it, and lay face down in the charred area for the next 15 minutes. As the wildfire raged directly above him, he survived in the oxygen close to the ground. End quote. Tragically, 12 of the smoke jumpers who failed to follow Dodge's lead perished. What also stunned investigators is they later found the crew had been trying to outrun the fire while still carrying their heavy equipment like chainsaws, axes, shovels, saws, and 20-pound packs. Without those, they could have moved at least 20% faster and may have been able to get to safety. Adam Grant said, quote, Dodge didn't survive as a result of thinking slower. He made it out alive thanks to his ability to rethink the situation faster. Twelve smoke jumpers paid the ultimate price because Dodge's behavior didn't make sense to them. They couldn't rethink their assumptions in time. No one had taught Dodge to build an escape fire. He hadn't even heard of the concept. It was pure improvisation. Later, the other two survivors testified under oath that nothing resembling an escape fire was covered in their training. Many experts had spent their entire careers studying wildfires without realizing it was possible to stay alive by burning a hole through the blaze. End quote. Ironically, in 1978, the U.S. Forest Service put an end to its policy that every fire spotted should be extinguished by 10 a.m. the next day. 
It decided that forest fires are a natural part of the life cycle of forests, and fires in remote areas, where human lives were not at risk, should be left to run their course. That information had been known since the 1880s, but was not acted upon until 1978. That's the power of rethinking. It's needed at every level of society. This has been a summary of Think Again, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know, written by Adam Grant.